Tribe, Book 2, Todd Mills Mystery, author R.D. Zimmerman, publisher, Scrib Pub, Minneapolis, Minnesota, narrator, Eric Ost. Chapter 13 You know it's been nice getting to know you these past few months, said Jeff as they approached his house. Thanks, replied Todd. No, I mean it. I never understood why Michael cared so much for you. I just didn't get it. I mean, you seemed so uptight about being a homo. Trust me, I was. Michael was very patient. Michael was a saint. Todd pressed on the brake, began to pull over in the snow, and said, Yeah, I really miss him. And Rollins is a doll, too, Jeff continued. Or Mandu, maybe you call him Tiger? Maybe. He's a bit more complicated than Michael, but he's still fab. Batting his eyes and queening it up, Jeff said, Oh, I just love a man in uniform, don't you? He may be a cop, but I haven't seen him in a uniform yet. I think most detectives wear street clothes. Oh, I'm sure he's got a nice blue police outfit hanging somewhere. You should just get down on your knees and beg. Okay, Jeff, I get the idea, replied Todd, rolling his eyes. Can you believe it? I've known him since he had his very first uniform. He was a Cub Scout. And then a Boy Scout, too. Jeff shook his head. He was such a little firecracker. Who would have guessed all three of us would turn out queer? Michael, Rollins, me. Well, I guess I was the obvious one. French poodles like me always were. And I used the past tense because I no longer have the hair to poof up. He said with another laugh as he ran his hand over his balding scalp. Life certainly turned out to be different than Father Knows Best, hasn't it? No kidding. Did I ever tell you that I'm pretty sure my dad was gay? He was a sweetheart and very unhappy. I guess he really didn't have much of an option back then, but instead of coming out, he drank himself into the grave. I mean literally. He got real drunk one night and drove 60 miles per hour right into an oak tree. It's a long road. Lordy, ain't that the truth. Todd pulled up to Jeff's small house just off 46th and Lindell, a quaint one-story bungalow with a large chimney right at the front and a steep roof now getting buried under a mantle of snow. His former home, a huge Victorian in an unsavory part of town, having burned nearly to the ground, Jeff had moved here about a month ago. How are you setting the in? asked Todd. The best thing about getting burned out is you don't have any boxes to move, he said and then started cackling. And I kind of like this new place. It's tiny in comparison to the old house, but it's mine. No family ghost. Besides, I get to buy all new furniture with the insurance money. I've been at Dayton's looking at couches on almost all of my lunch breaks. While Jeff and he had certainly become friends since Michael's death, they hadn't ever talked much beyond the superficial. So was this to be the time? Could Janice wait? As if he were reading Todd's mind, Jeff said, I always invite my taxi drivers in for a drink. Here for a quick one? Janice is so wrapped up in that baby, I'm sure she won't miss you. Todd looked at the car clock. He thought about the takeout food waiting to be eaten. He recalled Janice's downcast mood. What was it with her, anyway? You know, thanks anyway, but I've got to get back. What's the matter, big boy? Ain't I your kind of guy? Pressed Jeff, batting his lashes. That's not the point, Jeff. There'd been a time, however, when a queen like Jeff would have been too threatening for Todd, when his swishy hips and fey wrist would have twisted Todd's insides with a homophobic question. If I'm gay, do I have to act like that? And only once Todd had realized that he himself didn't have to wear high heels did the full rainbow of sexuality come into focus. Oh, okay. Good night, gorgeous, said Jeff, leaning over with pursed lips. Todd felt a big smack of a kiss on his cheek, which he returned with a large hug. He then waited as Jeff trudged through the snow and up to his front door. Only when Jeff stepped halfway in and turned and blew Todd a kiss did Todd put his car in gear and start off. He pulled a U-turn, plowing through the ever-deepening snow. There seemed to be fewer and fewer cars on the road. Glancing down a side street, he saw a couple of people skiing down the middle of the street. He didn't know how long he and Janice would end up talking, but perhaps he'd wind up spending the night at her place, which could be kind of fun. In fact, he should probably just plan on it after all. Janice most likely wouldn't be able to get around in her car tomorrow, so she'd probably want him to get some supplies, formula, diapers, whatever. And again came the gnawing question. 
Whose kid was it anyway, and what had Janice gotten herself involved in? Just up ahead, he saw a young woman pushing the rear of a car as the driver tried to steer out of a parking space. Todd slowed, watched as the car rocked back and forth, but failed to make it into the main part of the street. Following Minnesota winter etiquette, Todd stopped and climbed out. You want an extra hand? Oh, that'd be great. The tires are just stuck in a rut, said the girl who was pushing. If you can believe it, my friend and I are trying to make it down to First Avenue to hear a band. Do you think you can make it? Yeah, well, if we do, we're going to park in one of the city ramps and leave the car there overnight. We'll take a cab back. She brushed aside a long strand of red hair. Say, aren't you that TV guy? I was. Wow, that was really terrible what happened to you and everything. Sorry. Thanks. The driver gave the car a long, gentle thrust of gas. The tires spun and Todd and the girl leaned into the rear of the car and pushed. At first, it seemed as if the car wouldn't budge, but then it began to inch forward in a quick blip. The tires popped out of the rut and the car surged forward and into the street. Keep going! Don't stop! shouted the young woman who'd been pushing. She ran after the car, then turned back to Todd and shouted, Thanks! You bet! called Todd. He got back in his Cherokee, watched as the other car fishtailed down the street, and wondered if they were even going to make it to the next block. When he pressed on the gas and plowed into a snowdrift, he wondered about himself as well. Driving slowly, though he headed toward Minnehaha Creek and made it back to Janice's in about ten minutes, he pulled in behind Jeff's car, shut off the engine, then bounded through the deepening snow up to the front door of the large Spanish-style house. When he found the front door locked, he knocked and called. Hi, it's me. I'm back. Oh, June. But there was no reply, no movement of any kind from within. Presuming Janice had taken the baby up to bed, he wondered why she hadn't left the door open. Glancing around at the thick flakes that were falling as steady as ever, he knew he couldn't stay out here forever. He pushed the doorbell. Janice? Still nothing. No reply. Shit, how long was she going to be tied up with the kid? Or perhaps she was down in the basement, throwing in a load of laundry or something like that? Todd pressed the bell again, knocked too. If worse came to worse, he supposed he could go next door and phone her from there. Perhaps she was upstairs and simply couldn't hear. He waited, what seemed like forever, and just when it looked as if he would have to go to the neighbors, he heard some rustling, then the lock. Hurry up, Janice, I'm freezing to death, he called. The door slowly eased back several inches. Todd dusted the snow from his shoulders, his head, then peered into the house and saw no one inside. He stomped his feet and started to step in. Janice? Todd pushed on the front door, which swung half open, and there she was, pressed flat against the wall of the entry hall. The baby in her arms, but her face looked tortured, a steady stream of tears running down her cheeks. What is it? What's the matter? Todd demanded. She glanced to her left, looked behind the door. Todd pressed on the front door, swung it completely open. Jesus! He shouted. A large man holding a gun emerged. Holy shit! It flashed through Todd's mind that someone had broken in. Janice was being ripped off. This was a robbery. At the sight of the pistol aimed at his chest, Todd flinched. Took a half step back. Immediately the gun was raised higher and Todd froze. What the hell's going on? Demanded Todd. Her voice quivering, Janice said, I don't know. From his work on the crime eye team at Channel 7, Todd knew you weren't supposed to fight these things. That if you were held up, you were supposed to just cave in and give them all your valuables. Yet, when he quickly appraised the situation, everything changed. All the stories he'd heard vanished. These were, This wasn't about stereos or jewelry or cash. No, this guy was too well-dressed, too professional-looking. Todd glanced at him, then at Janice, and noted the way she was clutching the mysterious child. Oh, shit, thought Todd. That's what this is about, isn't it? So when the intruder, who was still standing partly behind the door, silently waved Todd to move toward Janice, Todd knew he had to act. With his right shoulder, Todd plowed into the open door, which sent it hurling against the intruder like a solid wall. At the same time, Todd ducked and swung as hard as he could, with his left hand punching the guy in his right side, directly in the kidneys. Oh, God! shouted Janice, clutching the baby and turning away to shield her bent over. Todd assumed the very worst, expected a blast. He kept diving forward, swung at the intruder again. 
Janice, run! Get out of here! Then it came, not a gunshot, but a powerful blow. Todd felt it on his shoulder, this powerful explosion of pain. The guy had hit him with the butt of the pistol, the thick metal smashing into him. He stumbled, and next he both felt and heard it on the side of his head, a huge thunk that reverberated through his body. Oh shit, he realized, I'm falling. Todd opened his eyes, saw alternatively a flash of white, a burst of black. Crap. He threw out his hands, tried to catch himself as he tumbled onto the tile floor. Todd! yelled Janice. Oh Christ, there was nothing he could do, he'd lost. That was already more than clear, and he felt a powerful blow on his left side. The bastard was kicking him, hammering him with his foot. The air rushed out of him and Todd collapsed, tumbled into a quiet black world. A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold, to offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides. And in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew, reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time being true to their values.